We all know that vaccines save lives. Generations have already benefited from not knowing the fear and dread of smallpox, for example. Immunization programs have been so successful and safe that measles, polio, rubella, just to name a few, have been so rare in the recent past that the public has started to forget what damage these dangerous infectious diseases can do and how deadly they can be. Of course, that means that we as a medical community may be a little rusty in recognizing them as well. Our mission now is twofold. First, to educate effectively and to redirect the misinformed. And second, we need to have a working knowledge of the clinical presentation of these vaccine-preventable illnesses. Defense Against the Dark Arts of Infectious Disease Today on The Playbook You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research and reviews and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to The Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horachko. A lot of damage has been done to public health with high-profile personalities handing out misinformation. We feel the brunt of that struggle every day on the front lines. More importantly, our little people suffer, our elderly suffer, our pregnant mothers suffer. Who are the canaries in the coal mine of medicine? We are. In this day and age, we'll need to know how to recognize them when they inevitably creep into our EDs. In the medical community, we talk a lot in generalities of the importance of immunizations, but we need to know and we need to be reminded of the specific dangers that these preventable illnesses pose, and even more germane for us in acute care, how to recognize an illness that we shouldn't have to know clinically. Today, we'll go back, way, way back, to old-school clinical findings and management of these vaccine-preventable illnesses. The dreaded 13. Here, in Part 1, we'll go through them in the order of the routine schedule, from hepatitis B through rubella. Later, in Part 2, we'll talk varicella through meningococcus. Hepatitis B is the silent lurker. Most adults who have hepatitis B don't know they have it. Only 30% will develop the icteric form of the disease. Hepatitis B is transmitted through sexual contact or through the percutaneous route. It's 5 to 100 times more infectious than HIV. An overlooked and Potentially deadly means of transmission for hepatitis B is perinatal. The mother may not know she's infected, and she may have subclinical findings. An adult flips a coin whether he'll develop signs or symptoms. But that's vastly different for children. The younger you are, the more susceptible you are to hepatitis B. 90% of infants who become infected with hep B will become chronic carriers. One in four of those children will die later in life because of a vaccine-preventable illness. Once infected, the child or adolescent may be asymptomatic, or he may present with a type of serum sickness, anorexia, nausea, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain. Chronic hepatitis B may present with fatigue, polyarteritis nodosa, and glomerulonephritis. If an infant acquires hepatitis B perinatally, he has a 5% per decade risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So, the 20-year-old you're seeing now who was infected by his mother has a 10% risk of cancer. 
the 40-year-old has a 20% risk of developing cancer, and so on. There's no good treatment for hepatitis B. It's mainly supportive and, frankly, wishful. The interferon drugs are reserved for a subset of patients and are not universally tolerated. Think about hepatitis B in the unvaccinated child or adolescent with abdominal pain, fatigue, or jaundice. Screen with liver function tests and hepatitis B titers. The surface antigen means that there is an active infection. Think of it like this. You're just scratching the surface of the complications. It's very early. The hepatitis core antigen means that you've gone chronic. Your first happy birthday vaccine that you get when you're born before you leave the hospital is your good old hepatitis B vaccine. You get a second dose at two months and finish the series sometime before your toddler. The hepatitis vaccine is safe and typically has no reaction. Some will get a mild fever or soreness at the injection site, but a day or so of that beats cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma any day of the week. Diphtheria sounds like an old-timey name for a disease that we just don't see anymore. But it's alive and well, the gram-positive Corinobacterium bacilli. Diphtheria is the old Greek word for leather because of what it does to our mucous membranes in the pharynx and hypopharynx. This is a nasty illness that can affect the airway, but... It can also affect the brain, heart, kidneys, and skin. The sneaky thing about diphtheria is that it looks so vague and nondescript initially. You get a sore throat and you feel tired. You may have a low-grade fever and maybe some cervical lymphadenopathy. Not much to go on so far, right? all pretty generic until you start to see more. That mild pharyngeal erythema that you see today becomes areas of white adherent exudate that turn into a gray pseudomembrane that bleeds with gentle scraping. Patients often have so much edema that they present with a bull neck. A serosanguinous nasal discharge is very specific to diphtheria. You may see a young child with strider, but it's not croup. Or you see a hypoxic child struggling to breathe, but it's not pneumonia. You go in to intubate and it's a bloody mess. If diphtheria doesn't end you by taking away your airway, it'll try to get you by going systemic. Myocarditis, heart block, Neurologic toxicity ranging from weakness to total paralysis, renal failure, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, mycotic aneurysms. If you're lucky, you'll get off easy with only a cutaneous finding of chronic, non-healing skin ulcers with a dirty gray membrane. The diagnosis of diphtheria ideally is clinical, but Since it's an infectious disease that should be stamped out already, we may not recognize it initially. If you see sore throat, malaise, cervical lymphadenopathy with a gray pseudomembrane that scrapes with bleeding, you've made the diagnosis. You can confirm with a culture from respiratory secretions on a special medium. In the ED, you may get a gram stain, and if you do, it'll show gram-positive rods in what is called a Chinese character pattern. Alternatively, PCR will detect the diphtheria gene, but it won't tell you whether or not that gene is producing the toxin to cause the clinical syndrome. Culture is needed to confirm. Diphtheria initially is a good mimic of group A strep pharyngitis, or infectious mononucleosis, or even just viral pharyngitis. 
Diphtheria is so dangerous that you need to treat right away with an antibiotic, but you can't even wait for that to work. You need to co-administer an antitoxin to squelch the progression of the disease. Early airway management is important in a controlled setting. Respiratory droplet precautions and call the Centers for Disease Control or your equivalent to get the antitoxin shipped to you. Give erythromycin or penicillin G, both IV initially, until the patient can take PO at some time and go home on oral erythromycin or penicillin V. Close contacts and any household members should be given a single dose of PEN-GIM. Now, all of this can be avoided with the DTAP shot, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis at 2, 4, and 6 months of age with two more doses over the toddler and preschool years. Speaking of the DTAP shot, let's talk tetanus. We're all about tetanus prophylaxis in the ED. Why? Because tetanus is everywhere. Clostridium tetany spores will never be eliminated from this planet of ours. There's no herd immunity for it. Tetanus can present in one of four clinical patterns. Neonatal, generalized, local, and cephalic. Neonatal tetanus is thankfully rare in developed countries, but in developing countries, there are thousands of deaths still per year. If the child survives, he may be neurologically devastated. Clostridium tetany is an obligate anaerobe that loves damaged tissue. It proliferates and produces tetanospasmin, the tetanus toxin. The toxin travels retrograde up your axons to the spinal cord and to the brainstem, binding irreversibly to the receptors along the way. So, the toxin disinhibits excitatory impulses. In other words, the net effect is increased muscle tone, painful spasms, and autonomic instability. Remember, your adrenal glands have neural input to regulate them. If you lose that, the adrenals are stimulated without a negative feedback, catechols rush out, and you get sweating, tachycardia, and malignant hypertension. Now, the good news is that Clostridium tetany doesn't grow in healthy tissues. It's an obligate anaerobe. That's why traumatized tissues are its jam. But think also about other ways tetanus can proliferate. In co-infected tissues, in ulcers, or where a foreign body has been causing focal tissue damage. So who gets it? Neonates do if the umbilical stump is infected. Luckily, with standard hygiene practices, this is rare. The post-obstetric patient is at risk from a septic abortion. Post-surgical patients are prime targets for tetanus. Older patients with poorly controlled diabetes and infected ulcers, also injection drug users. So how are we going to recognize it? The incubation period for tetanus is anywhere from days to a month, but the cases that I've seen are usually a week or so after a traumatic wound in an under-vaccinated person, and usually this is going to be an adolescent or older. You may see trismus and be faked out that there's a strep throat or a peritonsillar abscess. But remember, lockjaw usually has no throat symptoms. You may see the rhesus sardonicus, the sarcastic smile. If you can get the mouth open, there may be an exaggerated gag reflex causing masseter spasm. This is the spatula test highly specific and sensitive for tetanus. With tetanus, you may see someone with intense muscular spasms. Even gentle stimuli like light touch or loud noises or just a reaction to bright light can cause the spasms. Remember, 
There's no inhibition of excitatory impulses in tetanus, so every stimulus prompts an exaggerated, unchecked response. These guys are not a mystery, especially if you get a good history that fits it. The trickier version is generalized tetanus. Autonomic hyperactivity in a generally weak young person. What would you normally think of? MI or pheochromocytoma or a drug overdose. But keep in mind, generalized tetanus. Tetanus is like diphtheria. You have to stop the toxin as well as the bacterium causing it. Metronidazole or penicillin G will do the trick. You'll also need to give the tetanus immunoglobulin IM. Do this around the wound before you debride it. Remember, if there's a wound, you have to debride it. We have to get rid of the toxic swamp of tetanus for source control. Another scenario to remember is the unvaccinated or undervaccinated child who sustains a tetanus-prone wound like stepping on a nail. You should update his tetanus vaccine, but the vaccine takes two to four weeks to work, so you have to protect him in the meantime with the tetanus immunoglobulin IM at a site far away from his vaccine so that the immunoglobulin doesn't neutralize it. Pertussis is the last of the DTaP trifecta. And like the other two, pertussis has been around before time. Humans are its only reservoir, and Bordetella pertussis is pretty weak outside of the human respiratory tract. It doesn't survive long as a fomite. We could potentially rid ourselves of it. Since it's been around forever, it has quite the reputation. Pertussis is called by many names. Tosferina, the savage cough, or Koichusen, the gasping cough, Kashliuk, the nightmarish cough, or even Yaku Nichizeki, 100-day cough. Pertussis starts with the catarrhal stage, the cold symptom stage, with a runny nose, usually without fever. If you have it, maybe it's very low grade, nothing crazy, lasting a week or two. Then comes the paroxysmal stage, when the coughing spells increase in intensity. The child or adult cough, cough, cough <coughs> for quite some time without being able to breathe in. The patient is struggling to breathe and usually can't during the paroxysms of cough. You may see pallor or cyanosis or even sweating. Then, after what looks like a temporary asphyxiation, the cough stops and the child takes a large breath in and a deep whoop. A common finding is post-tussive emesis, something we see in any viral illness, but the coughing and pertussis is so severe that post-tussive emesis is almost inevitable. The paroxysmal stage may last up to two miserable months. Then, just when you think things are calming down, pertussis just doesn't go away. You enter the convalescent stage, where it lingers, sure, maybe a little better, but it's still annoying. It's still there for another month or more or even 100 days. Now, that sounds more like a nuisance than a life threat. And for older children and adults, that's mostly true. Pertussis just seems like the cold that takes forever, or the bronchitis that's hard to shake, or the wheezing that goes on for some time, especially in the non-asthmatic. For babies, though, pertussis is a killer. And it's sneaky. Infants may not even have the chorizal stage. 
they might just have a mild cough initially until they enter the paroxysmal stage, the most dangerous for them because their little frames are plastic and not rigid and they have a harder time with any increased work of breathing. So, an infant will gag, gasp, cough, vomit, have bulging eyes, and cyanosis. Apnea and bradycardia from pertussis can kill an infant. Another complication is pneumonia or even seizure. Pertussis is a classic cause of sudden infant death and may present to you as a brew, a brief, resolved, unexplained event, or what we used to call an alti. The highest risk infants are those less than three months of age. Even vaccination does not protect you completely. You can still get it, just a milder version, which means you're better off. But you still spread it to babies who don't finish the first series of three shots until they're six months old. This is another reason for herd immunity, to keep the bacterium away from everyone especially the most vulnerable, which includes the sick, the elderly, the pregnant, and those with a lower vital capacity. So, it's a tricky diagnosis. Sure, if the patient has the typical presentation, the registration clerk can make the diagnosis from across the room. But what do we do if we're unsure? You may see a leukocytosis, it's a common but non-specific finding, and it's not important to stick the poor little kid for this, but if you happen to have a CBC, it's important to recognize that a marked leukocytosis is a well-established association with pertussis. The higher the WBC and the higher the lymphocyte count, the worse the disease severity. Chest x-ray is just as vague and nonspecific. It looks a lot like a bronchiolytics chest x-ray. In infants less than four months of age, be suspicious of pertussis and ask about family members with compatible symptoms and think about pertussis with unexplained cough, especially with low grade or no fever. If pertussis is a distinct possibility in the well-appearing young infant in front of you that you may be sending home, a white blood cell count may help you to decide to hospitalize the baby while you're waiting for their testing. A white blood cell count of greater than 30,000 per microliter is associated with significant morbidity in pertussis. The truth is, it's much better and safer to overcall it in the less than four month crowd. Certainly admit the baby who presents after episodes of cyanosis, bradycardia, or poor feeding. For infants and children older than four months, even if they're partially vaccinated, consider pertussis for paroxysmal, non-productive cough with or without whoop, or those with post-sessive emesis, subconjunctival hemorrhage, inspiratory whoop, or sweating between paroxysms. Basically, it's acute cough plus any one of these. Paroxysms of cough, inspiratory whoop, or post-tessive emesis. The Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization say, just treat. Azithromycin is a popular choice acceptable for any age. Any suspicion? Any at all, just treat it. We can't wait for confirmatory testing like PCR or confirmatory culture. Remember, getting a proper nasopharyngeal specimen is tricky. The fatty acids in cotton swabs will kill pertussis, so you need those polyester or nylon swabs. The CDC has an excellent video on how to collect the specimen properly to increase your sensitivity. Another scoundrel of infectious disease that is trying desperately to make a comeback is measles. Here's how it goes down. You're not fully vaccinated, or maybe you are, but 
herd immunity in your area is waning and you have a significant exposure to the virus. It enters your respiratory mucosa or conjunctiva. You know, just those particles floating around in the air. It incubates for a week, maybe even three weeks, to the point that you can't even track back to why you feel so terrible for about two to four days. Is it a cold? Well, maybe, but you're so tired and you don't want to eat and you have a fever, conjunctivitis, cough, and coryza. Maybe it'll go away. But this time, it's a little different. About two days into it, you see small, white, gray-blue eruptions on a red base in your buccal mucosa. Hmm, that's weird. I wonder why. Oh, now you know why. The rash. An ugly red maculopapular blanching rash. It's like if you had a can of paint named measles red and you poured it on someone's head. It spreads in a cephalocaudal pattern and centrifugally from the trunk to the extremities. There may be scattered petechiae. The rash may be so bad that it's hemorrhagic in some areas. Usually, the worse the rash is, the more severe the illness presentation. By the time the rash comes, your little white-gray-blue eruptions, or sometimes people call it grains of salt on a red base, your coplex spots, they start to slough off. It's important to look for these since you can really improve your accuracy of diagnosis here. You'll see pharyngitis, non-purulent conjunctivitis, and maybe lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. Everything seems inflamed in measles. The rash lasts about a week, and it will start to fade in the order it appeared. Now, it would be great if we knew there was an outbreak and recognized the classic presentation. But, of course, nothing in medicine is easy there is a clinical variant we need to watch out for. Modified measles happens to someone who's vaccinated or has even had measles before. The paramyxovirus is just so immunogenic that it can cause a breakthrough infection and reaction. Since there's some prior immune memory, the presentation is milder in modified measles good for the patient, but not so great for us trying to recognize it and alert public health. Remember, you can still get measles if you're vaccinated. That's why there's strength in numbers in the herd to form a buffer against the spread of measles. So you can see how when we see a child with a viral syndrome and a rash that we may not be thinking measles initially. If you get a child, or an adult for that matter, with a bad flu-like illness looking terribly miserable with a rash, you'll likely work it up, not really knowing what we're looking for. If you get a CBC, you may see thrombocytopenia or leukopenia in measles. A chest x-ray may show interstitial pneumonitis. Urine might show giant cells with inclusions. Again, Measles is a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes it's hard to see it for what it is. We diagnose clinically if at all possible, and to confirm, our strategy depends on the disease prevalence. In areas with high measles vaccine coverage, it's less likely, so we want to be sure. You can use serum anti-measles IgM and you can PCR any body fluid, including nasal discharge, blood, or urine. Culturing measles is difficult. It requires a special medium, and only a few facilities can do it. Well, so what? What if we miss the diagnosis? A child well enough to go home is likely to do just fine. It's mostly supportive care anyway, right? Yes and no. Yes, Keep the child hydrated. Yes, you can give vitamin A. It was traditionally given only in developing countries in the setting of malnutrition because low levels of vitamin A correlate with severity of illness in measles. 
we're gathering more and more evidence now that children, even in developed countries with normal to above average BMIs, may still be malnourished. The World Health Organization now recommends vitamin A to all children with acute measles. In developed countries, it's usually given for severe measles and to those children who are hospitalized for it. I say, stay simple and follow the WHO. Give it to everyone. It won't hurt if it's in excess for them and it may help. Everyone gets one oral dose daily for two days. For infants less than six months, 50,000 international units. Six to 12 months, 10,000. And those one year and above, 20,000 international units daily by mouth for two days. So now we come to the no's. No, it's not just supportive care. It'll go away. No problem. If we don't diagnose and manage measles, it will spread, especially to the vulnerable infants, elderly, and pregnant. Diarrhea is the most common complication. A superinfection with otitis media is usually just annoying but can be dealt with. But respiratory complications can kill acutely. Measles pneumonitis can be life-threatening. Measles disables your T-cells. Secondary infections kill. If a measles complication doesn't kill you right away, it can maim you. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. If these don't kill you with their 20% mortality, they will leave you severely neurologically damaged permanently. No amount of essential oils or energy crystals can fix that. Mumps happens. Like measles, mumps is a highly contagious paramyxovirus spread through respiratory droplets. If you're exposed, the mumps virus incubates for two weeks. That whole time, you're shedding the virus to everyone around you. When you talk, cough, laugh, sing, or share glasses or utensils. Then you get a flu-like illness of fever, headache, and myalgias for a few days. Again, something that we may not recognize as mumps if they come to the ED at that time. Only a few days later will you see the parotitis, either unilateral or bilateral. It can last for a week or more. It can also get real. Or chitis. No one ignores this one. Again, unilateral or bilateral, Orchitis occurs about a week after the onset of the flu-like illness. Testicular pain is severe. Mumps may end in infertility, only to be recognized decades later. Mumps can be trickier in girls and women because ovaritis will present like abdominal or pelvic pain. It may look like an appendicitis. In straightforward cases, you've made the diagnosis. If needed, you can send blood and buccal swabs, but it gets complicated with when serum IgM or IgG or virus levels appear and disappear, so just look that part up if you ever need to. Other complications of mumps include meningoencephalitis or deafness, even Guillain-Barre syndrome. Pancreatic tissue is very similar in structure to salivary and gonadic tissue. Anything that has an endothelium or synovium can be affected. Arthritis or even myocarditis can be a sequela of mumps. Mumps is like measles in that there's also the real possibility of meningoencephalitis. You can't turn back time and you can't cure mumps. You can offer supportive care with NSAIDs and cold packs and keep them quarantined and hope for the best. (laughs) 
rubella is now rare in developed countries because of successful vaccination programs. The rubella vaccine was introduced in the U.S. in 1965. Prior to that, there was a hit rate of 58 cases per 100,000. After the vaccine, 0.5 cases per 100,000. Rubella is rare now, but outbreaks are still possible and they still happen, most recently in Japan, for example. There, it started in older adults whose immunity had waned over time, then the virus got out into that local community and it spread like wildfire regionally. The trouble with rubella is we're probably going to miss it. Some people are asymptomatic vectors for the virus. Some will have a mild, acute febrile illness with a rash. Rubella also goes by the name of German measles, or better put, three-day measles, because it looks like a milder, gentler form of measles. Typically, you have a low-grade fever and lymphadenopathy for a few days before what looks like a viral exanthem. The characteristic pattern rubella is posterior cervical, posterior auricular, and suboccipital lymph nodes. There may be mucositis or conjunctivitis with rubella as well. We shouldn't spend too much time on trying to remember how to find something that we will inevitably miss unless there's an obvious outbreak. What we should focus on is a reminder to parents who choose to withhold vaccines. Congenital rubella syndrome. Rubella is like the thief in the night who steals your unborn child's healthy, productive life. And you'll never know it until you give birth to a blueberry muffin baby. The virus suppresses bone marrow, and it suppresses splenic function, so the developing baby's only physiologic option is to try an extramedullary solution. That's why babies are born with purpura, extramedullary hematopoiesis. That's also the least of our worries with congenital rubella syndrome. The baby will suffer from intrauterine growth retardation, and possibly he'll have meningeal encephalitis, hearing loss, cataracts, glaucoma, interstitial pneumonia, cardiac defects, hepatitis, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. There's more, but I think that will do for now. Rubella is the quintessential vaccine-preventable illness. It's devastating. It's stealth. It's non-reversible. And it's totally preventable. Misery, you have many names. I will call you now Rubella. So I know I don't have to convince you that vaccines save lives and prevent so much morbidity and misery. But hopefully now we have a better working knowledge of these vaccine-preventable illnesses so we can have a more effective, more specific discussion with parents who may be misinformed or unconvinced. In the next part of this two-part series, we'll go down the rest of the routine vaccination schedule to talk about the second half of the dreaded 13, from varicella through meningococcus. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.